I've been watching um, a couple of different pastors online and seeing how, how they begin some of their sermons. And there's a, a pastor from America called Rick Warren, and he starts pretty much every single sermon that he does by saying to his church, have I told you that I love you lately? <laughs> That's pretty cool, isn't it? And if you look at Paul's letters, the Apostle Paul, when he was um, writing to the different churches, he started almost all his letters in the same way, by thanking God for the faith of the churches that he was writing to. And then he would pray that, that they would get to know God better. I think that's a pretty awesome way uh, to start uh, speaking this morning. And I just wanted to let you know that the pastors of this church love you guys. And we're praying for you. We're thanking God for your faith. And we're praying that you'd get to know, we would all get to know God better together. And that's what I'm praying for us this morning. Although we, we've finished um, officially the revival series, we're going to be continuing looking at the themes of revival and prayer look at a towering figure of faith from the Old Testament, King Hezekiah. He led Jerusalem, uh, Judah through a spiritual revival, and also it was through one of the darkest hours of Israel's history. And he did it, as the Bible says, while trusting God from the beginning to the end of his life. Hezekiah, it says, was a good king a king who turned the nation back to God. He removed all the, the idols and pagan worship from Judah. He got rid of all that stuff, and he also invested heavily in, in the worship of God, in God's temple. He extended it. He polished it up. He decorated it. He lavished it with, with loads of pure gold, and he greatly developed the city of Jerusalem as well. That's the kind of guy that he was. And I want to look today at one aspect of his life that if you read his story in 2 Kings 18 to 20, which is a fantastic bit of the Bible, by the way, if you haven't read it or you haven't read it in a while, do go and read it. But if you read those couple of chapters, you'll see all over the place that his, it's his prayer life. We can learn so much from the, the way he prayed, what he prayed for, how God answered his prayers, when he prayed, when he didn't pray. And there are three things I want to focus on today. The first is, prayer powerfully changes the course of history. And we should spread out our problems before God. Number two, prayer powerfully changes the direction of your life. So we don't need to be resigned or fatalistic. We can pray for, ch for positive change. Number three, God gives us opportunities to pray for change, specific opportunities. And we don't want to miss those opportunities that he gives us to pray for change. So that's where we're going this morning, those three points. So Hezekiah, a good king in a long line of bad kings who hadn't followed God, who'd led the nation of Israel away from God. And the, God's people have been split for many years into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, since the time of Solomon's son. Hezekiah revived the, the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, uh, but there is big trouble coming. Very soon after Hezekiah becomes king, things kick off. Further up north, we have the Assyrian Empire. They were the world superpower of the time, and it's been flexing its muscles. Four years into Hezekiah's reign, when he's 29 years old, Assyria invades Israel, the northern kingdom, and they mean business. The last time they invaded Israel, Israel paid them off for a thousand talents of silver, but there's no paying them off this time. In three years, Israel is defeated, and most of its people are taken into exile. And that leaves Hezekiah with an extremely serious and mounting problem. Because he's been rebelling against the king of Assyria by not paying tribute for years. The Assyrians have conquered all of the northern kingdom. That was the bigger and more powerful of the two kingdoms of Israel. How long will the Assyrians put up with Hezekiah's rebellion? Eight years after the fall of the northern kingdom, it happens. Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, he attacks every single fortified city in Judah, except for Jerusalem. He's coming for that. 
There's no question of trying to fight the Assyrian army. It's way too powerful. So all of Judah has taken shelter in their fortified cities. But the problem is the Assyrians were specialists in siege warfare. And so every single town, one after the other in Judah, is taken and destroyed one by one. And finally, there is only the big fortress city of Lachish, it's the second most important city in Judah, and Jerusalem left. That's all there is. And Sennacherib and his army have surrounded Lachish and they're besieging it. And it's going to fall. Hezekiah, meanwhile, is in Jerusalem. And he's preparing for a siege there too. What do you think was going through Hezekiah's mind as he's stopping up the springs so that there'll be no water for the Assyrian army when they arrive, as he's stockpiling food uh, for the siege, as he's trying to encourage his soldiers, as he knows the Assyrian army are coming? What do you think was going through his mind? Well, perhaps a reminder of what the Assyrians were like will give us an idea of the kind of pressure that Hezekiah was under. Because you see, the Assyrians were infamous for their brutality in controlling their empire. In the British Museum, hands up who's been to the British Museum in London. A few people have. If you haven't been to London, I highly recommend the British Museum. It's a great place to go. In the British Museum, there is a whole section devoted to the ancient Assyrians. You know, they have huge statues and giant, they have these city doors, which they think may have been the doors from the city of Nineveh, the capital city. And in this collection, there is a massive carved stone frieze that would have been on the wall of a palace. And it was made to celebrate the destruction of the city of Lachish, Judah's second most important city. So it's all historical stuff, you can find it. In the, in the British Museum. And you can see examples in that museum of the Assyrian brutality. The way they ruled their empire, it was through fear and through horrifying oppression. Whenever they conquered a city, they would make an example of the people within it. So there are carvings in the British Museum of men using two hands like this to rip the skin off the legs of the soldiers that they conquered. They flayed them alive, ripped off their skin and left them slowly to die. They did that to thousands of people. Others they would impale on poles. They'd stick them alive on a pole and they did that to hundreds and thousands of them. You can see the carvings in the British Museum. That's what happened to the Jews at Lachish. And Hezekiah knows that that's what happened to all the other towns, all the other cities that have come under uh, the Assyrians. They weren't just defeated, they were decimated. That's what they've done to every city in Israel, and that's what they're going to do to Jerusalem. So it's no wonder that Hezekiah, as he sees Lachish is going to be captured, that this godly man, we know he's a godly man, he does the only thing that he can do in his own power. The only thing he can do that might just save Jerusalem. He sends a message to Sennacherib saying, I've done wrong. I've done wrong. I'll pay anything you ask. Just leave us alone. I'll pay anything you ask. So Sennacherib asks for 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold, which would be about $8 million in silver and about $70 million uh, in gold today, but it was almost certainly worth a lot more back then. And Hezekiah, the same king who's led a revival in Jerusalem and Judah and who lavishly extended God's temple, he went back into that same temple and ripped out the gold that he had put there to honor God. Can you imagine what that felt like for a godly man going into the temple that he's helped extend and ripping out the gold he put there. And he packages it, packages it up and sends it to Sennacherib. It's an act of desperation. If this doesn't work, nothing else could, humanly speaking. Sennacherib took the money and carried on exactly like nothing had happened. And as Lachish begins to fall, the Assyrians to the Assyrians, Sennacherib sends a second army. He had so many men, he could send, it says a huge army. 
He sends another huge army with his top commanders to Jerusalem. And he sends them there with a message. As his messengers, they taunt the people of Jerusalem and laugh at them. Where is this confidence of yours coming from? Why do you keep up this pathetic resistance? Who are you depending on? Egypt? You're counting on an army coming from there? Egypt is utterly unreliable. Or are you depending on your God? Do you think he's going to save you? What about the gods of all the other countries we destroyed? They didn't save anyone from us. Your God can't do a thing. So why not surrender? Come out. We'll treat you well and take you to another land even better than this one. That's all lies, of course. But Hezekiah's leaders are obviously rattled by it because they ask the Assyrian commander, please don't speak in the local language because the soldiers on the wall, they can understand what you're saying. But the Assyrian commander just replies, is this message just for the king and his leaders? Isn't it for everyone in Jerusalem? After all, aren't they the ones who are going to have to drink their own urine and eat their own dung as the food runs out and they starve the same as you will? He tells the Jews to choose life, not death. And that's especially cutting because I think he probably knew he was quoting from the Jewish scriptures, from the Old Testament when he said that. Because in the Old Testament, God says, stay close to me, obey my commands, choose life, not death. The implication is clear. The Assyrians believe that in this situation, God is not in charge of life and death, certainly not the Jews in Jerusalem. They believe the Assyrians are in charge of it. It's spitting in the face of God. It's mocking the God of Israel. This is the terrible situation in which Hezekiah and the whole of Jerusalem find themselves in. And you can see why we spent some time just understanding this. What do you think Hezekiah does now? On the brink of, of such a complete disaster, we can't even get our heads around it. He's done everything humanly possible to save his kingdom, and it's all come to nothing. Now he prays. He tears his robes to show his distress. He wears rough cloth and covers himself in ashes, and he goes into the temple to cry out to God. He sends Isaiah the prophet, who was also in Jerusalem, a message saying, maybe God will hear the mocking words of the Assyrian commander and rebuke him. So pray with me. And Isaiah the prophet, he responds to Hezekiah and says, God says this, don't be afraid. Sennacherib will hear a report that will make him leave, and then I will have him cut down by the sword. And God promises to save Jerusalem. But it doesn't happen immediately. Sennacherib does hear a report that the king of Cush is coming out to fight him, so he leaves Lachish in pursuit. And the army commanders surrounding Jerusalem with their army, they withdraw too. But as Sennacherib is leaving, he sends a message in a letter to Hezekiah, kind of like a parting shot. And he says, in effect, don't get too comfortable. I'm coming back to get you. Don't trust your God. You are as good as dead. That's essentially what he says in his letter. And then this is what Hezekiah did. And this is from the reading that we had earlier on. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. And Isaiah brings another message in reply, saying the same thing as before. Sennacherib's time is up. Jerusalem is safe as it can be. God is going to defend this city for the sake of his servant David. And then the Bible says this, that night 
the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. Can you imagine being in Israel at that time? In Jerusalem, knowing what was facing you? And then this? They were about to be ripped to pieces. 185,000 soldiers dead. You know, that doesn't just mean the end of a battle or even the end of a war. This, this practically meant the end of the Assyrian Empire. After this, they go into decline, and it's the Babylonian Empire that rises up to replace them. Sennacherib was killed by his own son when he got back to Nineveh, worshipping in the temple of one of his gods. This means peace for Israel for many, many years. Assyria is no longer a threat because God saved them. Hezekiah spread out the letter from Sennacherib before the Lord and prayed, and God changed the course of history. This is point number one. Prayer powerfully changes the course of history. So we should spread out our problems before our God. I love that image of Hezekiah with that letter, with everything it represented of human power and oppression. And he took it and he spread it out before God in the temple. Can I suggest that we trust that prayer to our living God still changes the course of history? Can I suggest we spread out our problems before him. Maybe you're asking, but Josh, does this, does this kind of thing still happen today? Why don't we see big scale miracles like this more often? Well, let, let me answer that with a story. It's a story of Dunkirk. Have you seen the Christopher Nolan film? There was a recent uh, film by the British director, Christopher Nolan, called Dunkirk. Hands up who's seen that or heard of it, maybe. It was a relatively, I think it was pretty big in the UK. It's a cinematic retelling of the time when the entire British army and sections of the French army and other armies too were cut off and being chased out of France at the beginning of World War II. Hitler's armies and air force had ripped through France and now the only thing that could be done was to retreat back to the UK as fast as possible. The Nazis were closing in and it looked inevitable that they would catch the British army uh, on and around the beaches of Dunkirk and utterly destroy them. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers. The British army would practically have been wiped out right at the beginning of the war. I want to read you, uh, this is an article posted on Premier Christianity last year. It says this, The German high command was able to boast with confidence that its troops were proceeding to annihilate the British army. That the total destruction of an entire army was imminent was a view shared by many in the military and political leadership of Britain. Prime Minister Winston Churchill found himself preparing to announce to the public an unprecedented military catastrophe involving the capture or death of a third of a million soldiers. On the 23rd of May, King George VI requested that the following Sunday should be observed as a national day of prayer. Late on the Saturday evening, the military decision was taken to evacuate as many as possible of the Allied forces. On the Sunday, the nation devoted itself to prayer in an unprecedented way. Eyewitnesses and photographs confirm overflowing congregations in places of worship across the land. Long queues formed outside cathedrals. You can find the pictures online of these massive queues um, coming in to pray outside the cathedrals. The same day, an urgent request went out for boats of all sizes and shapes to cross the English Channel to rescue the besieged army, a call ultimately answered by around 800 vessels. Yet even before the praying began, and the author says, in my experience, prayer often works like that, curious events were happening. In a decision that infuriated his generals and still baffles historians, Hitler ordered his army to halt. Had they continued to fight, the destruction of the Allied forces would have been inevitable, and the war would have taken a different, darker, and more terrible path. Yet, for three days, the German tanks and soldiers stood idle while the evacuation unfolded. 
Not only so, bad weather on Tuesday grounded the Luftwaffe, which is the German Air Force, allowing Allied soldiers to march unhindered to the beaches. In contrast, on Wednesday, the sea was extraordinarily calm, making the perilous evacuation less hazardous. By the time the German army was finally ordered to renew its attack, over 338,000 troops had been snatched from the beaches, including 140,000 French, Belgian, Dutch, and Polish soldiers. Many of them were to return four years later to liberate Europe. Sunday, 9th of June, was declared a national day of thanksgiving. Thanking who? God. And encouraged by Churchill himself, the phrase, the miracle of Dunkirk, began to circulate. Many people believed that the prayers of the nation, as they cried out to God, a whole nation spreading out their problem before God was dramatically answered. They were desperate, like Hezekiah was. They cried out to God, like Hezekiah did, and their prayers were answered. They still call it the miracle of Dunkirk. I don't know if there's ever been a time when England came out to pray like that. Isn't that amazing? Prayer powerfully changes the course of history. We should do what Hezekiah did. Spread out our problems. Individual problems, national problems, international problems. Our God is big enough. That's what we were singing about earlier. Our God is big enough. Spread out your problems before the Lord and pray for his deliverance. Cry out for change. Makes me think of the bushfires. Makes us think of abominations like the trafficking of people around the world for sex. Spread out our problems before God. Cry out for change. Hezekiah and the prayers of Jerusalem changed the course of history. And they had peace. That's point number one. Prayer powerfully changes the course of history. Spread out our problems before God. That's the first section of Hezekiah's life the Bible tells about in 2 Kings. The second part of his life comes immediately after. We've seen God moving on a, a national, on an international level, saving Israel from Assyria. But now we see Hezekiah himself personally afflicted. He was seriously ill, a life-threatening illness. Isaiah the prophet comes to him and reports a word from God which <laughs> is not too comforting. He says, put your house in order, for you are going to die. You will not recover. How would you feel at that moment? You survived a terrible disaster with the Assyrians where God fought for you. It's a massive miracle. Now, God has told you through the same prophet who predicted that God would defeat the Assyrians that you are going to die. I don't know about you, but I'd be very tempted to just give up at that point. I mean, after all, if that's what God says, then isn't that the end of it? But what does Hezekiah do? It says this, In those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you're going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Do you see that? He cries out to God with bitter tears. He reminds God that he's served him wholeheartedly. And this is one of the many times in the Bible where God tells a person something and it seems like he tells them in the hope that it will elicit a response from that person. He tells them because he wants them to respond in a particular way. God told Moses, stand aside so I can destroy the Israelites after they had sinned with the golden calf. Do you think he wanted Moses to stand aside? Or did he want Moses to do what Moses actually did, which was throw himself down before God and beg and pray for God to show mercy to the people? I think God wanted to see Moses, and he wanted Moses to see Moses 
stand in the gap for the people. I think that God, I think that because God relented. He didn't destroy the people. He wanted to elicit a response from Moses. And I think God told Hezekiah he was going to die to draw out a response from him. So after he prays and cries out to God, God tells him, I'm going to give you 15 more years to live. God gives him a sign to show that he's serious, and Hezekiah fully recovers from the illness. And I suggest this point too. Prayer powerfully changes the course of your life. So don't be resigned or fatalistic in a situation. Persevere and pray for positive change. You know, sometimes I think we might be tempted to think, maybe the dark situation I'm in is God's will, therefore I shouldn't bother praying that it will change. But I think stories like this in the Bible are a reminder that we're never to be resigned to a bad situation. We're never meant to stop praying. God responds to our prayers. Just like Jonah, do you remember the story of Jonah? He preached, which city did he preach in? Nineveh. That's the capital city of the Assyrians we were just talking about. And what did he preach to them? He preached, God is gonna destroy this city in judgment. But what happened? The whole city of Nineveh, the Assyrians, repented. They got down on their knees, they, they repented in dust and ashes and cried out to God for mercy. And you know what happened? God gave them mercy. Why did he tell, through Jonah, why did he tell them that he was going to destroy the city? Wasn't it because he hoped to draw a response out of them, to give them an opportunity to pray and repent? to elicit a response. Even though he told Hezekiah that he was going to die and would not recover, Hezekiah prayed and God healed him. You know, yes, it's true. God doesn't always heal, and it's a mystery why he heals some and not others, and we know that. He does things his way, his timing, and on his terms. But the Bible tells us he loves us. And everything that I see in Scripture suggests that we should not give up asking for change, but persevere in prayer for positive change, even when it looks like the writing is on the wall. What is it in your life that maybe you've got to the point where you no longer believe it can change, and you've given up praying for it? I remember hearing a, a pastor from India telling uh, how his child was born with a condition that meant that he couldn't move, he was completely paralyzed. He said his, uh, his son was, was like a vegetable. But he started praying every single day for his son, and bit by bit, increment by increment, the baby started to smile, then he started to move a little bit, and then finally he was completely healed over several years of praying. The course of his life changed. Through prayer and faith, the course of your life, however rigid its direction looks right now, can be radically changed by God. Hezekiah cried out and prayed for God if it were possible to change what had been assigned to him. Does that sound familiar? Do you remember what Jesus prayed at Gethsemane? If it is possible, take this cup from me, but not what I want, but what you want. If Jesus prayed that, there's nothing unholy about praying God would change your condition or situation, even if he doesn't. Never stop praying. I love Nick Vucic's approach to life. He was born without arms and legs, and his, his journey to faith and the joy that he's found in Jesus is, is absolutely amazing. You can find lots of his videos online. He says that God has used his lack of arms and legs to reach hundreds of thousands, even millions of people with the message of hope in Jesus all over the world. I just saw a video of him speaking about hope in Telford State Prison in the US. It's incredible. He tells the story how he, ha he has no arms and legs, but he was also born with a condition that meant his spine would crumble to nothing over time. 
doctors said there was, there was nothing they could do. But as he prayed and as other people prayed over a number of years, he went back to the doctor and they said, we don't know how it's happened, but one of the holes, he had three massive holes in his spine, one of the holes has sealed up, it's gone. We don't know what's happened. A year or so later, he comes back and they say, we don't know what's happened, but the other two holes have closed up too. And now he has no holes in his spine. He still has no legs or arms, right? But God healed his spine. But you know what I love about him? He says that he still has a pair of trainers in his closet. Just in case God ever answers his long-term prayer for arms and legs. Isn't that awesome? He's not resigned to it. He knows. He knows it's up to God. That God is more than capable of changing the course of his physicality through prayer, but he keeps praying. Is there something in your life that you've become resigned to, that, that you've stopped praying for God to change? Don't stop. Keep praying. Never stop bringing it to God. God hears passionate and honest prayers. Keep asking for change. Never stop. Prayer powerfully changes the course of your life. Don't be resigned. Persevere and pray for positive changes, whatever God does. That's part two. There's a final section of Hezekiah's life that the Bible shows us. We've seen two success stories so far. Are we going to get a third? Let's find out. So after Judah was saved from the Assyrians and after he was healed and his life was extended, Hezekiah had this incredible time of peace. A peaceful reign in Jerusalem. It was prosperous. It must have been an absolutely amazing time to have been alive in Jerusalem after they'd been saved from, from these incredible disasters and his, his faith must have been soaring. Then one day, some men from a far-off country called Babylon came to visit because the Babylonian king had heard Hezekiah was ill. And Hezekiah showed them round. He showed off all his wealth. He, it seems he was kind of keen to impress them. And then Isaiah, the prophet, came and asked Hezekiah, what did you show them? And Hezekiah said, I showed them everything. There was nothing that I have I didn't show them. And then Isaiah said this. It says, in, uh, then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood who will be born to you, will be taken away. And they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. That's a horrifying prediction. Coming from the same prophet who predicted the Assyrians would be destroyed. Now, knowing Hezekiah's character and his track record, what do you think he did when he heard this news from Isaiah the prophet? How many of you would say, I know where you're going with this, Josh? He prayed, right? Well, this is what it said. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied. For he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime. Oh, Hezekiah. You know, when he was in desperate trouble, he prayed and God delivered him from the Assyrians. When he was desperately ill, he prayed and God extended his life and healed him. But when he hears that his people will suffer terribly and be forced out of the promised land of Israel and taken in chains to Babylon, all he says is, this is good, because it won't happen to me or in my lifetime. Why do you think God told him it would happen? Do you see how God told him what would happen so that Hezekiah had a chance to respond? What would have happened if Hezekiah had done what he'd done before twice already? What would have happened if he had prayed and fasted and cried out to God on behalf of Judah and called the whole nation to pray and repent? 
He's already seen what happened to the northern kingdom. But it's still not enough to move him to pray. Now, guys, I don't know about you, but I see a lot of myself in Hezekiah. How often does God present us with an opportunity to pray for a situation or on behalf of people we know who are heading in the wrong direction, but because it isn't urgent or because it doesn't directly affect us, we are complacent and choose not to pray. If only we'd choose not to miss the opportunities to pray that God gives us. God gives us specific opportunities. And this is point number three. God gives us opportunities to pray for change. And we don't want to miss those opportunities. Maybe there's a situation in your family or in the church or in your workplace that seems to be slipping. Don't miss the opportunity to pray for change. You know, we've just seen from the life of Hezekiah, the power of God is released through prayer. God gives us opportunities where he points something out to us, like he did just here with Hezekiah. Someone we know, a situation we're in, where we are positioned to activate prayer, like Hezekiah was. Hezekiah was in the perfect position to call the country to repentance and pray on hearing that message. We are often positioned for particular people, particular situations. In that last case, he did not pray. And Judah was led away in chains just a few generations later. What if he had prayed? What if he had responded while there was still time and led Judah to pray for repentance? It's, it's so easy, isn't it, to be complacent when, when God warns us and gives us an opportunity to pray. It reminds me a bit of, of climate change. We're often complacent because the real impact isn't going to affect our generation necessarily. It's going to be future ones. But there is, of course, a far greater danger for everyone than climate change, as terrible as that is. A far greater danger that God has told all of us Christians to be involved with as our primary calling. We live in a world that needs to come to repentance and trust in Jesus, or they're headed to the edge of a cliff. They're heading for an eternity separated from God, hell. Are we missing the opportunity to pray? We have friends, we have family members. We see people around us who don't know Jesus, who, who need him more than we can even understand. But you know, there's hope. How did Jesus call us to respond to this situation? He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send more workers to bring in the harvest. There are people out there who are open and ready to respond to Jesus, but there are not so many, and we know it's true, there are not so many willing to take that message to him, to them. Pray to God that he will send more workers, people willing to stand in the gap for others. We can do that. We have this opportunity to pray. For as long as we're alive, we have that opportunity to pray. And you know what I love about this? I'm sure that as we do that, as we pray and we, we repent, actually, we repent of our own complacency, where we've been like Hezekiah, saying, as long as I'm safe, I'm not so bothered about other people. As we pray, God will deal with our complacency. As he as he deals with our hearts, he will we'll find ourselves saying, just as Isaiah the prophet said, here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. We have an opportunity to pray. And as we pray for more workers, God may stir us up to be part of the answer to that prayer. Let's not be complacent and miss the opportunities God gives us as a church and as individuals to pray to pray for change, to pray for revival, for those we know and those we don't yet know who need Jesus. We can learn, can you see how we can learn from Hezekiah's success and from his failure? We can pray individually, we can pray in our small groups, we pray in our one-to-ones and in our families, crying out to God for change. There's a group that meet on Thursday mornings in this room to pray. We have pizza and prayer every other week in the evenings to pray. We have 
home groups, all these other opportunities. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am with them. There's a special power to people praying together. If you're not going along to some kind of meeting where you can pray with others, can I encourage you to get involved? We have the opportunity to pray. Let's not miss it. As the band comes back up, let's, let's recap. Prayer powerfully changes the course of history. We should spread out our problems before God. Prayer powerfully changes the course of your life. Don't be resigned to what's happening. Pray for positive change. And three, God gives us opportunities to pray for change. Let's not miss those opportunities. How about we pray now? Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for what we can see in the life of Hezekiah that we can we know that it, it's, it's written for us to learn from. We know that prayer powerfully changes the course of history and prayer powerfully changes the course of our lives and that you give us specific opportunities to pray for prayer and you've called us to pray for more workers to tell people about you i pray father that you will stir us up i pray that you'll forgive us for where we've been complacent as we all have at times i pray that you give us a passion for you a passion and a faith to know that we can pray for change it's all in your hands but we have this opportunity to pray we pray, Lord, please raise up workers for your harvest in this church and outside it, God. May many come to know you and be saved. We thank you, God. You are the one and only Lord over this world. Thank you that we can bring all our prayers and spread them out before you. Please fill us with your spirit and help us get to know you better and take the opportunities you give us to pray. In Jesus' name, amen.